Wander Wealthy Podcast, Episode 250. What is up, my friend? Welcome back to another episode of the Wander Wealthy Podcast. And it's just not another episode. This is the 250th episode of this podcast. I cannot believe we are at a quarter of a thousand episodes. I mean, that's a lot of podcasting time. That's a lot of podcast episodes. That's like five years almost of podcasting. And it's been longer than that. I've taken some breaks here and there, but over the past couple of years, we've been pretty dang consistent. And I'm just super thankful that you show up each and every week. Or if you're new here, you have just found us and you're tuning in. So thank you for being here for the 250th episode. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Tess Wicks. I'm the founder of Wander Wealthy, host of this amazing show with 250 episodes and a financial coach turned business coach. And the Wander Wealthy podcast has really evolved along with my own business and career as a coach, going from giving financial advice and interviewing other financial experts. And now I help you anyone out there who wants to become a money coach, financial coach or wealth coach, figure out how to do that. Figure out how to navigate the business building waters. And that is in many different ways, talking about marketing and selling, building your program and kind of operating your business. Also figuring out your niche market and kind of everything in between. And today we're going to be talking about a little bit of the in-between stuff. I'm taking this opportunity this week to reflect on the past year and potentially even beyond, and looking at some of the unhealthy business habits that I have personally developed that I'm going to be dropping as we go into the new year. And you might have noticed that I also allude to how to avoid burnout in the title of this week's episode as well. And it's because that I believe a lot of these habits can drive a business owner to burnout. So I want to make sure that we reflect on these and you, if you're listening, whether you're brand new in this space and you kind of want to heed a warning of someone who's been through it, or you're, you know, a few years into your own business as well, and you're really starting to resonate with some of the unhealthy habits that I'm sharing, this is really just consider this like a community kind of come together. And these are some things that we are giving each other permission to drop if that's the case. So that's a little summary of what we're going to dig into in this week's episode. But before we go any further, let me introduce you to this week's sponsor, which is my signature 12-week personalized coaching program for your money coaching business, the Wealthy Coach Blueprint. Now, this is an eight-phase business building blueprint that really helps you know exactly what to be focusing on and when. So if you are at a point, whether you're brand new to the industry or you're feeling a little bit lost and a little bit stuck, then know that what you're going to get when you join the Wealthy Coach Blueprint is a step-by-step process to go through where we're either going to be defining for the first time what your zone of genius is and who your niche market is and developing your framework for your money coaching, or we're going to refine it. If you've been through this already, if you've been building your business for a bit, but you're feeling stuck, you're feeling like you don't really know how to actually get your business to a place where it is sustainable and scalable. So both either way, whether you're in that brand new stage or you've been seasoned but frustrated we are here to help you. And I work with my clients personally with my eyeballs on their business to really help them navigate the waters, the confusing and also like very murky waters of entrepreneurship because there's no guidebook. There's no kind of step-by-step process. And when you have a money coaching business specifically, there's a lot of nuance that as a money coach myself, I wanted to offer solutions to. So the Wealthy Coach Blueprint, 12 weeks, one-on-one coaching with me, and this can really kickstart your new year to really make sure that 
you're ready to make your business happen in 2022. You're ready to bring in new clients, make more money, and make a bigger impact. So you can head to wanderwealthy.com slash blueprint to check out all of the details and fill out an application. When you fill out that application, you're going to answer some questions about where you're at in business, where you want to go, and then determine how you want to take the conversation from there. If you want to jump on a clarity call with me to learn more about what's included in the blueprint and also allow me to get to know you better. Or if you're just ready to do this thing because you've been sitting on the sidelines and you're ready to dive in. I'm giving you the option this round to determine how we move that needle forward for you and your business. And you can kick it all off by heading to wanderwealthy.com slash blueprint. All right, let's dig in to the four unhealthy business habits I'm personally dropping in 2022. And if you need it, allow this to be permission for you to leave them behind in 2021 as well. So the first one is not asking for help. Yes, not asking for help. Meaning in 2022, I'm going to be asking way more for help when I need it. I think that as a solo business owner, you know, we wear so many hats and we also tend to put a lot of pressure on ourselves. And specifically as money coaches, right, we're very cognizant of how much money we are spending in our personal lives and also in our businesses. And so we're always looking for a deal. We're always looking for a way to keep our business really lean. And that is something that I'm very passionate about. But I also know that one of the best investments that I make in my business and even like in my overall well-being is when I get help. And help can look like many different things. You know, you can actually invest in help in terms of like people and outsourcing so that you can do less work on your end. So, you know, what I'm specifically referring to is one of the best help that I get on a weekly basis is I have a podcast editor who edits each of the episodes and make sure that the podcast goes live every single week. And that's such a great investment for me because all I have to do is make the notes and sit down and record the podcast. And that is such a great investment that I make in just being able to maintain my consistency in my business and, you know, just create more space for me to focus on other things inside of my business. So help can look like hiring assistants, hiring personnel and hiring, you know, different ways you can outsource uh, certain tasks that you have to do. Usually it helps when it's like tasks that happen on a recurring basis within your business. But help can also look like having someone who can help guide you. I think, again, as business owners, what we really miss out on that I think we're very much wired to need from our school system, from the traditional nine to five is guidance, is someone who can act as kind of a manager. And so that's where I really see, you know, business coaches coming into play or special specialty coaches that come in. Maybe they're not specifically business, but they're a marketing coach or, you know, they're really helping you and guiding you with some things to be focused on, things to do, things to just keep a little bit of structure for you in your business. So help can happen from kind of two different ends of the spectrum, I suppose, where you might be guiding someone else, but they're kind of taking that that weight off of your shoulders and doing the work for you. And then you also can have help where someone else is doing the heavy lifting of coming up with the ideas or determining what the plan is. And then you just have to plug in and implement. So a lot of times people think as a solo business owner, like you need to be the leader only and leadership is important when you are an entrepreneur when you are your own business owner but you don't have to always be leading and this is something for me that I have kind of come to the realization that although I'm a leader in terms of my community I love leading and being a coach for my clients I also need someone to hold space for me and over the course of 2021 I have been so focused on investing in, 
you know, me being the leader and therefore hiring and outsourcing in terms of my personnel and people who can take tasks off my plate. But I have you know, really neglected investing in someone to lead me. And that's important to me. It's important because I need someone to pull the weight off my shoulder on the other end. I need someone, you know, who can help guide me and help me make decisions, the bigger overarching leadership decisions. I also need to be in integrity with what I'm asking all of you to do. You know, I, as a business coach, am saying, hey, I can be that leader for you. And I need to reflect and go, who am I being if I'm not investing in that kind of help as well, right? So going into 2022, I'm already super excited that I have, you know, acquired some of my, I guess, the the upper end of that help in terms of finding space holders for me so that I can better hold the space for my clientele and also for the people who are helping me in all the other ways by, you know, outsourcing, taking the tasks off of my plate. But I want you to know that it's okay for you to ask help in both ways. And really, like, you just have to reflect on where you need it. And I think determining, especially if you're earlier on, because I think one of my biggest issues earlier on in my business when I didn't have necessarily all of the resources, all of the financial capital to just invest in both sides of the spectrum, right? I didn't have the money to be able to say, yes, I'm going to have a business coach and I'm going to have a VA and I'm going to outsource my podcast and I'm going to have, you know, all these other things. I had to prioritize. And I think the best thing to do is really sit down and go, where am I spending most of my time where I don't need to be? Am I spending way too much time thinking about what's the right next step to take? Am I spending too much time kind of spinning my wheels, figuring out what I should be doing, why I should be doing it, how I should be doing it? Or am I spinning my wheels and spending too much time actually doing the thing. And if it's actually doing the thing, then it's easy to have someone come in and actually do it for you and figure out how you can take yourself out of it. But if you're spinning the your wheels on the what and the how, a little bit less on the how because I think, you know, outsourcing can help you with the how, but you still have to know how if you really want to be able to provide those direct instructions. So, a little bit less on the how, but the what specifically, like what do I need to be focusing on? What do I need to be doing today? Then you're probably looking more for someone like a business coach or someone like even a life coach or um, therapist to really help you kind of consolidate and and reconcile those thoughts and everything that you're you're moving through. So that's how I would sit down and determine which type of help you can prioritize right now. And ultimately, the lesson here is knowing that asking for help is the new black, right? Let's go into 2022 saying it. it is always, always worth the investment to ask for that help. So identify where you need it and then take that step forward. No matter how, how scary it is, if you're spinning your wheels and if you're spending too much time there, then you're probably wasting your time. It's time to, you know, get quicker answers and quicker results. The second unhealthy business habit that I am dropping in 2021 so that I can go into 2022 feeling so much better is over consuming content or slash I guess this is a slashy uh, consuming before I'm creating and for me specifically you know, I've shared my advice around this many times and I think it's time that I, you know, it's gotten to a point for me where I'm not heeding my own advice. And for a long time, I have had a really strong boundary with my consumption of content. And for me, it's specifically consuming content on social media. And I think over the course of the pandemic, it has just gotten worse, right? My, my, um, and maybe you've experienced this too. I bet most, many people have is that, you know, our ability to say no to ourselves, it gets harder and harder, you know, the more you're having to deal with kind of everything else. And what we do know from the pandemic is, you know, other than the actual virus itself is the mental toll that the rest of, 
our circumstances is taking on us. And so our ability to kind of stand firm and strong in like, I have a boundary around how much I'm allowed to consume. It's just kind of gotten depleted. And so it's hard for us to not give in to, I don't want to call it a guilty pleasure or indulgence, but I guess that's the best way right now I can think of it. Like for me, guilty pleasure indulgence is to like, open up Instagram and go look at, you know, all these entertainment things, right? Um, Or (laughs) God forbid, open TikTok and then there goes three hours of my life. And, you know, that's the way that I can kind of decompress and detach from work after a long work day. But it also has kind of permeated into my actual work day. And what's interesting about this, and again, I've, you know, I give my clients lots of advice around how to compartmentalize social media for work versus social media for your personal life. Personally, I have two accounts. I have an account, my Tess underscore Wix account, which is fully a, you know, my money coaching, business coaching for money coaches account. That's the topic that we're talking about regularly. And then I have a personal account where I follow all the other things that are just like totally random and purely for entertainment purposes, as well as like my friends and family and whatnot. So I'm able to separate the two. And therefore, during work hours, I can really focus on the Tess underscore Wix account, which is for Wander Wealthy. It's for my my business coaching and my money coaching. And that's where I show up. Now, again, that worked really, really well until I think you know, for me, the pandemic has taken this toll where then I, I guess my ability to just not switch over and indulge in all of the quick entertainment has weakened. So knowing this and also knowing that I am fully well capable of surviving without social media altogether, I need to kind of strike a balance and reset that boundary. So something that I've decided is for, you know, the last couple of months, I've really lost this kind of passion and ambition of posting on social media. Um, I've made, like I've always said, I my main content creation platform where my consistency lies is within my podcast. Um, but also, again, posting on social media is a secondary uh strategy for me. It's also the main strategy that I teach for my clients. And so I want to make sure that I am showing up and what I'm creating when I show up is at my best. So instead of forcing it, which has not been working in the past couple of months for me, um, I've decided I'm going to unplug for the rest of 2021 so that we can kickstart 2022 and feel refreshed. And unplug in the way that I'm deleting the apps from my phone. I'm not allowing them to be a place to go to, I guess, escape. I'm really making a conscious effort to kind of clear my mind. Because what I found, again, is that all of this kind of quick, quick bite entertainment is really causing my actual creative control center to be depleted even before I can sit down and go, well, what do I want to create today? So I talk a lot about this, especially for anyone who feels stuck or feels like they're in a funk when it comes to creating social media. I do think, or social media content, I do think that it's important to kind of find your consistent schedule and to keep your boundaries in place. But if you are finding yourself kind of like fried at the ends, then it's probably a good idea to just do a full on reset. And that full on reset, you know, can look like not posting, but I think you need to take it that step further and go into a no consumption. And I don't want to call it a diet. So like a no consumption uh, period (laughs) and determine how long that period is going to be and just do it and then come back with a refreshed headspace. And here's the deal. So many people won't do this because they have a fear. So they'll continue to post and they'll continue to post content that's subpar, just not anywhere near what they can be creating to really make sure they're connecting with their clients, but they'll continue to post because they have a fear that they're going to lose relevancy in the space. They have a fear that, you know, people are going to forget about them or that 
they're going to lose clients or they're never going to get clients because of it. And the truth is there are other ways to leverage and share your message and recognize that there is possibility that you might be taking a step back to replenish yourself in order to spring forward. And that's very real, you know, but that's also okay because if you're not healthy, if you're not in a good headspace, if the content you're creating is just for the sake of putting it out there to like maintain your consistency and and stay relevant even though it's probably not hitting and it's probably not the best of what you could be creating, then it's not actually doing anything for you. So if you need to hit that refresh button, it's probably the best idea to actually shut it off, take the break, reset your headspace, reset your creative control center and come back without having all that you know, other content you're consuming flooding in, right? So if you feel like 2021, and honestly, like I'm giving myself grace here and recognizing that sometimes the rules don't apply because I do talk about the importance of maintaining your consistency, you know, even if you don't feel creative, even if you don't feel inspired, you can create your own inspiration. You can manufacture creativity through momentum, but in order to have that momentum, you have to kickstart it right so that's what I typically preach and I'm also saying right now sometimes the rules don't apply sometimes your your brain is fried and sometimes you've been navigating a global pandemic and the ups and downs that we've all been experiencing throughout the last two years and you actually just need to unplug fully and do a full reset So for me, that looks like, you know, the past couple of months, I've been trying to recreate that momentum. I've been trying to re, I've been trying to create my, my inspiration because I know that's possible. But now I'm kind of like, yeah, I'm probably just fried. And every single moment I have, I find myself opening Instagram, but only to consume. And I don't like that habit and I want to leave it behind. So I'm leaving it behind by detaching fully, by deleting the apps from my phone for the rest of 2021 and, you know, through the first week of the holidays in uh, 2022 so that I can come back stronger and better and from a healed place. So I'm actually excited about this. And yeah, here's the deal. It might mean that even though I'm launching for the Wealthy Coach Blueprint right now, not everyone is going to know about it. I'm not going to be talking about it so publicly on social media. I'm telling you here and, you know, my best clients, they come from my podcast. Here you are listening, tuning in. Uh, But I also am, I'm willing to do that because I know that I will show up better if I don't have that distraction and that kind of unhealthy habit just continuing to dig like a cavity. I really see social media as a cavity. There's a way that you can kind of prevent it taking over. But sometimes if you just eat too many sweets, no matter how much you brush your teeth, no matter how much you floss, it can still permeate somehow. And that's what's going on. So I need to go get it filled. And that means I'm going to have to take a couple weeks off. And I'm going to come back stronger with a brand new set of teeth. <laughs> better teeth, stronger, I hope, uh, in the new year. So over-consuming content. If you want to leave that behind, if you need the permission to say, you know what, I got to take a month or I got to take a week, fully shut it off, it's okay. You're going to be okay. When you come back, I mean, I don't even, some people might have missed you. Some people might miss you and that's great. That's what we want. Um, But I think a majority of people are also going to be none the wiser and that's okay too. We're just going to come back stronger than we were when we left. All right. I have two more unhealthy habits that I'm leaving in 2021 and these two go a little bit deeper. Um, The next one is one that I have developed over the course of building my business and I think I developed it out of necessity but now I finally am at a point six years into my business where I have a choice and I need to allow my brain to see that it's okay that I can drop this habit and the habit is allowing 
my business to be my hobby. So before I started my business, I was working in consulting and studying for actuarial exams because I used to be an actuary, which means since I was in consulting, I worked all the time. And when I wasn't working, I was studying. And that was my hobby. You know, since since college, studying was my hobby. I had so many hobbies in high school. And I had, a, I guess I had a couple of activities I was involved in in college. But for the most part, like I had to study outside of studying for college because that's the way the actuarial world works. And then when you graduate, you're still studying outside of your job. So studying really was my hobby. Um, And I made it fun, right? I found ways to make it fun. I would, you know, go to coffee shops and study on the weekends. Sometimes we would get time away from work where we, you know, we would get paid, but we would be paid to study so that we could pass these exams. Uh, But it really was you know, a huge part of my identity is just kind of working all the time. Cause like at the end of the day, studying was work. I was rewarded at work for studying and passing these exams. Um, and when I left my corporate job and left my identity of being an actuary behind in 2015, I poured that hobby energy of working into, you know, my business Um, And the truth is, it didn't feel like work all the time because I was working for myself and finally doing things that felt fun and exciting. But it was also fun and exciting because it was like I was trying to solve a big problem of how to make a full time living from this business. And so I decided, you know, this is this is fun. This is good. I, I feel productive. I feel like I'm trying to solve a problem so I can make some money, make a living, also help more people. and it made sense for me to kind of constantly spend my time doing that. So once I finally figured out how to make a full-time living from this business, how to impact more lives, how to build a a business that felt like it was on a good trajectory, I had almost forgotten that hobbies existed. My business was my hobby. I loved spending time on it. I loved going to that those coffee shops on a Saturday to get work done while everyone else was out, you know, day drinking or I don't know, working on their fitness. I love doing things, but only if what I kind of realized was if it felt productive and usually if that productivity meant I was going to make money. So would it make me money? Would it help my business? If it didn't, it didn't feel productive and therefore I wasn't allowed to spend time on it. And so I kind of grew up with these two lines of thought, right? Through, through, I grew up in terms of like through the early years of my business. Whatever I spend my time on has to help my business or has to help me fund my business by making money outside of my business if it's not making money inside of my business. And if it's not that, it doesn't feel productive. And if it doesn't feel productive, it's not worth, spending time on. And I didn't really realize that that was very unhealthy for me and my business and just like, but like most importantly me until this past year. So not having hobbies outside of business, I mean, it's not healthy. I think we all know that. But I also understand that like your business really can consume you. It can kind of take over because you need it to work and you need to spend time on it in order to make it work. So my, I guess, advice here, what I can offer, and and I honestly, what I'm doing is I'm speaking from the perspective that now I am at a point where I don't have to spend all my time on my business. So, or I don't feel like I have to spend time on all my business all my time on my business because the truth is you don't have to spend all your time on your business, right? If you put boundaries in place, Parkinson's law says that we will use the resources we're provided, right? We will use up any resource that is given to us. So if you say, if you work a full-time job and you say, well, I work on my business nights and weekends, then your business can take up all that time. If instead you work a full-time job and you say, I work on my business one hour per day during the work week and then two extra hours on Saturday. Your business can also work within those boundaries 
But most of us just don't put boundaries on our business because we're we have scarcity that if we don't spend the time, it will not make money. But that's not the truth. High leverage tasks, high leverage activities make money, not more of your time. That's the beauty of entrepreneurship. So for me, I had that belief and I also just like gave myself all of that time to make my business work. So I let my business monopolize my time. And now I'm at a point where I just no longer have that belief. And also my business is making money and therefore I guess I that's what allowed me to let go of the belief. And so for me, what I'm doing is really doing some self-discovery just purely around like what else I like to spend my time on. What did I used to spend my time on as, you know, a child or as a a teenager, right? Basically pre-college and getting back into those. So I have a piano now. I loved, I used to love to play the piano. I have a piano now to, to start playing on. I have really branched out and made friends. So just like spending time with friends in general, um, it was easy for me to kind of isolate and only spend time on my business when I lived in Chicago and, you know, I had some of my friends, but everyone else was very busy too. Um, It was also when I moved to Italy and didn't really know anyone. Again, it was easy to just put it all into my business. Um, But I made a very conscious effort of making friends, moving to Switzerland and over the past two years. I do enjoy working out, so continue to do that and very into home decor as of late and DIY projects. So excited about you know, all these new things where I can spend time on these hobbies outside of work. And if you're in the position where your business isn't at a point financially or client-wise, so you really feel like you have to put more time into it to make it happen, know that again, you can make your business work within the boundaries that you set, but you just got to set them and put them in place and then respect them and commit to them. I love using my calendar for that purpose and calendaring in when I'm spending time on my business and when I'm not. Um, And then also do that own self-discovery. Where do you like to spend your time? And I think the last thing is knowing that you have to detach from the idea that your hobbies have to make money in order to be worthy of your time or that you have to make money in order to feel productive or like you're making good use of your time. I think when in the culture of social media and seeing how everyone else is, you know, spending time on their work or constantly turning um, a hobby into a side hustle, we have this belief that if our time is not used, quote unquote, productively, and productive typically means like, you know, the house is getting cleaned or you're you know, even fitness can be feel like that is only a productive use of our time. And if you're sitting around watching Netflix, that's not productive. Um, so a house is getting cleaned, you're working on your fitness, or you're working on making money, then we can oftentimes deem it unproductive. But the reality is sitting and reading a book that's not personal development, that's not about your business, but just like a fiction book, that is equally as productive and refreshing and good for you as a human being than, you know, clocking in and making money at work or making money in your business. So that's the unhealthy habit I'm dropping in 2021. I've been working on it for uh, probably the whole year. um, And I'm excited going into 2022, just, you know, feeling like those boundaries are truly in place and that my hobby outside of my, I have hobbies outside of my business. I'm excited for that. The last unhealthy habit I'm dropping um, in 2021, and it's not coming with me in 2022, is a big one for me. This is a big, big, big shift for me. And it's something I've harped on for a long time, but I never really knew how to articulate it. And now I feel like I do. And that is conflating my business and also kind of supplementary to that, my life goals with the goals of the industry. So... I think you've seen it. I know I've seen it. There's constantly talk. I mean, how do I even put this? I guess I don't have a great way to articulate it as much as I thought. But the industry 
of online business. And then if you kind of shrink down from that, the industry of online coaching. And then if you shrink down from that even more, the industry of online money coaching or business coaching in my case, because now I'm, I'm on that side too. But the industry has grown. It's gotten bigger. And we've also seen kind of like a lot of people talk about their financial goals within the industry and what they're able to make and what their clients are able to make and all of that. And not only financially, but also the way that they work and how they work with clients, how often they work, all of that. So it's kind of like, it's definitely not a holistic view, but it's kind of this view of like productivity and success. I guess I would call it quote unquote success of the businesses within the industry and what they're aiming for. So here's what I mean by that. When I first started my being self-employed, making $1,000 a month online was like something that so many people couldn't even imagine, couldn't even dream. And maybe you're in that position right now, right? Maybe hearing that is like, if only that would be unbelievable, right? But the industry has 100% advanced beyond that, right? Then it went from $1,000 a month to $10,000 a month. Now everyone needs to aim for the 10K month. And maybe you're there and maybe you still see that around you. Now that you know, I've been in the industry for so long, then I see like the six figure month or, you know, between that, even before the 10K month is six figures a year. Um, but then you eventually you see the six figure month. And now in the industry, I'm constantly surrounded by, you know, especially in the business coaching world, other business coaches talking about the goal of having a multi six figure, but even now it's a seven figure business. And just now I'm also seeing eight figure business. So it's like this threshold is constantly evolving, which is a good thing. That's humanity. That's how it goes. But it's also that just like so much faster than anything else, anything we've seen outside of like the online business space, inside the online business space is just con a constant moving target. And what happens I find when we start to conflate our own business goals and also life goals with the goals of the industry is that we start to lose focus of like what we really wanted in the first place, right? Because all I really personally wanted and needed has been for me a six-figure business. So that doesn't even mean a 10k month, right? It literally is just like hitting six figures in my business means that I can pay myself between 50 to 60 percent of that, which is really, you know, a, a good amount for me to be able to live on and contribute to my family and my household. Now, it's always different for everyone, right? You need to understand your financial picture of what you need and what you want for your household in order to understand the revenue needs of your business. But for me, that's what it really takes for me. And that's all I want. And and beyond that, I mean, yeah, it's nice. I'm all about the manifesting and bringing in anything that that pops in beyond that. But I think what had me start to kind of lose sight of my own business why and and core rooting was this feeling of hitting that six-figure mark and then feeling like that's not good enough because everyone else kind of at my level is making multiple six figures or is making seven figures now. And so what do I need to do to hit that? And that started pulling me away from why I got into this in the first place and where I really want to be focusing my time and energy. So I said it was beyond the money, right? Because along with this pressure and expectation to scale financially is also this idea of, okay, if you're going to scale, you need to stop doing one-on-one -on -one coaching and increase your prices enormously and then outsource everything so that you only have to be working, you know, two hours a week. And believe me, I like working less than 80 hours, which is what I used to clock, you know, when I was early on in my business, because again, I felt like I had to. I like also working less than 40 hours, which is something that is is possible for me now because I have put in the legwork and the systems to get me to a point where I just don't have to work that as as much as I did before. 
because now I'm not rewriting emails constantly or re-coaching clients on the same topic because I have things that I've already created. I put in the legwork earlier to be able to send that out. But there is no need for me to outsource literally everything in my business. And personally, I've found that I don't thrive in that capacity, right? I talked about this earlier with, you know, finding, getting help and asking for help. And if that's outsourcing, that do it. If that's investing in your own space holding, right, with a business coach or therapist or other kind of leader that can help you ease the weight of decision making, then do that. And for me, that's where I need to be focusing right now. And this constant scaling of just like making my prices so unreachable when it comes to coaching with me or outsourcing everything entirely within my business so that I only have to clock in two hours. Personally, that's not my dream. I support anyone who dream that is. But what I'm again seeing more and more is as much as the kind of business goals, the financial business goals of like, we all need to aim for seven figures of revenue, which like, again, if you want that in your business, let's make that happen. It's me and determining what do I need to get there and not really wanting to be, you know, I was talking to my husband the other day and we were talking about like this idea of, I don't, I don't want to be a, a Nordstrom. I don't want to be a Target. I want to be a boutique store that you come to and, you know, you might pay a little bit higher prices than you would at Target, but like you're coming because you love the experience and the attention you get at my boutique store because I know you personally and I'm going to be in the shop almost every single day and you're going to get that personalized attention from me. And that's what I personally love about like, you know, if I were to equate my business to something like a shopping experience, I love those boutique stores where it's not completely out of reach. You know, you're not going to be paying the top of the line only available to 1% one per, 1 of the consumer's price points. You're going to be paying something more than you would pay at, you know, a Target or even a Nordstrom, but you're going to get amazing service. You're going to get amazing personalized attention and really feel good when, you know, it's over, when that shopping experience is over. So I think a lot of the industry is trying to push people to be a Target or maybe not necessarily a Target, but like a Nordstrom. And if not that, then you're going to be like a super high end boutique in Milan where I don't even walk into because I know that if I walk in there, I'm going to look at the price tag and walk right back out, right? Like, not to say that I am want to be the most affordable option on the market because I know that the investment that you put in is how much you're really going to care and commit to the process. And the process is not easy. So I need you invested in it. But I also really am desiring to make an impact in a way where I feel that the value exchange makes sense. But I also want to make the impact in terms of I want to work with my clients. I want to have the ability to impact other aspects of my business and not have everything so outsourced that I have lost the ability to, you know, be a part of it. So, you know, on one hand, I always think like, is this a me problem? Is this that I'm not willing or able to delegate or that I'm not willing or able to, you know, manifest and think big picture about this? But I also think that, you know, again, it's more along the lines of in the past, I've conflated my own goals with the goals of the industry. And I really want to bring it back down to what do I want? What is the business that I want to run for my clients and the experience I want to bring forward? And so I think that also kind of leads to, you know, um, scaling when it comes to coaching. And for me, I want that one-on-one -on -one experience with my clients. That's 
where I thrive. That's where I show up. I've done group programs. We've had an amazing experience in the past, but I have personally enjoyed myself in, in the process of the one-on-one. So I have now decided that I will only be offering one-on-one when it comes to, you know, the Wealthy Coach Blueprint and, and the coaching that I provide. And although I don't know if the Wealthy Coach Blueprint will maintain its current structure and the way that it's delivered from, you know, now until the end of 2022, I do know that one-on-one is still going to be the major part of my business because I do not have a desire to scale into group coaching and bring on, you know, co-coaches, even though, again, I think that that's totally viable for those who see scaling as something that they want to do and see working with even more people at one time something that they want to do. So I'm all in support of that for others. But my unhealthy habit that I'm dropping is conflating my business goals with the goals of the industry and seeing all these other coaches be like, I'm going to teach you how to scale it into group. I'm going to teach you how to work two hours a day through outsourcing. I'm going to teach you how to reach that seven figure mark. And for me, like, although again, cool if you want it, I personally want to run a very different kind of business that the industry isn't building. Um, but I very, very much love and have enjoyed running to this point and want to continue running it without that pressure to follow the like massive scaling expansion that the the industry is following. So feel like I'm opening up my heart a little bit and being a little vulnerable and kind of sharing where I feel like I personally went wrong in the past year, even past years, um, and the things that I'm changing and kind of accepting and being being willing to own up to and also to change for the new year because it's a pivotal time. So I hope that this was helpful or if you resonated with any of these points, I'd love to hear from you. You know I'm always available for you to reach out to over on Instagram. However, that's like my screeching sound. Uh, obviously, I won't be on through the rest of 2021. But if you do reach out to me there and leave me a message, I will get back to you when I log back in in early 2022. And I hope you have a wonderful holiday season where you're able to disconnect some and really in order to connect with your friends or family or whoever you're spending the holidays with. And there will still be podcast episodes coming out because, you know, that's my consistency that's where that's my home that's where I love to show up and chat with you so stay tuned for next week's podcast episode don't forget enrollment is open for the wealthy coach blueprint you can head to wanderwealthy.com slash blueprint to check out the details and fill out your application and until next time I hope you wander wealthy